Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Comptroller Peter Francho. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's meeting of the Board of Revenue Estimates with Treasurer Cobb and Budget Secretary uh, Brinkley. I'd like to begin by recognizing the Board's Executive Secretary and Director of the Bureau of Revenue Estimates, the indispensable Mr. Andy Schaffel, for his report. Andy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Comptroller. Thank you, members of the board. Uh, I'd first like to start off by thanking my incredible staff for the hard work uh, they put on, on this effort, as well as the staffs of the, the Secretary's Office, the Treasurer's Office, DBM, and the Treasurer's Office, um, putting in tireless work, as well as legislative services. Uh, tremendous efforts, especially out of Teresa Tuzinski, and we're very much appreciative of the collaborative work uh, that goes in from all of our all of our agencies. Um, and with that, I'd like to jump into the presentation if I could. All right. The first slide here is the official uh, forecast for the general fund for fiscal years 22 and 23. It's a lot of numbers for a PowerPoint slide, but I wanted to have this in as it is the official. It will be available on the website and it will be distributed through the press release. Uh, so for the interest of this being a PowerPoint presentation, I will pivot to a summary page um, here on the next slide. This also has a lot of numbers, but it is the nature of the beast here. This shows the summary of the changes to the forecast, uh, and it shows the major components. So first we have fiscal year 2021, which was closed out, and those figures were announced just recently. Uh, you can see at the bottom there for total, that is the total revenue impact uh, in that closeout. We finished with an extra $1.7 billion uh, in general fund revenues for fiscal year 2021. That was growth of just shy of 12%. Now we are proposing estimates for a new estimate for fiscal 22 and the first official estimate for fiscal 23. For fiscal 22, we are proposing an increase of $995 million above the prior official forecast. And then for fiscal year 23, we are proposing just shy of $1.4 billion uh, over what would have been prior planning figures. Uh, I do want to mention a few numbers here. You'll see the personal income tax in fiscal year 2022. We're proposing to write that up uh, $396 million. That is less than the fiscal 21 uh, closeout of above $903 million. There are some reasons for that. Uh, first is the American Rescue Plan, uh, the federal bill, had a couple of tax provisions that flow through to Maryland taxation. Uh, one is an expanded earned income credit for tax year 21. That expansion applied greatly to uh, single tax filers without children, uh, greatly expands the base and flows through to Maryland. And then another was the child and dependent care credit, which also expanded the base, but also increased the value of the credit. We are connected uh, to some of the definitions in federal tax law. Those flow through uh, together to reduce general fund revenues in fiscal 22 by about $250 million. Uh, so that is very important to note. Those only apply under current federal law to tax year 2021. Uh, I want to point out corporate income tax, up $323 million in fiscal year 21. There was a surge in corporate profits uh, post-COVID uh, after the declines it, that went deep in March. Uh, corporations reconfigured and found a way to continue generating economic profits. Uh, and along the way, as always happens in recessions, they were able to cut costs. So they were actually able to grow their, their top lines while cutting costs. And it's led to a surge in productivity uh, uh, and tax revenue. And you see that number come down in fiscal 22 and 23. And that's really because we have assumptions that wage growth is, is improving and will continue to improve throughout the horizon of this forecast. So that'll actually cut into corporate profits uh, going forward. There is also some issues in the supply chains that are rising, raising prices. Some of those uh, prices will be passed on to consumers, 
some of those will be consumed uh, by the corporate profits. And then the same with sales tax. We had a surge in fiscal 21. We expect to see a continued high level in fiscal 22 and fiscal 23. Uh, so we are talking about tremendous sums of revenue coming into this forecast. Uh, it is noisy from one year to the next. Uh, we have to also mention at this point that we are assuming in this forecast that the federal budget is resolved, that indeed the federal government does not shut down at midnight tonight. And we are also assuming that the debt ceiling is raised with no significant fallout. So we do have some pretty significant assumptions here. The debt ceiling being the most significant assumption regarded to the re related to the federal government, uh, and it is critical that they get that debt ceiling raised. All of this traces back to the federal fiscal stimulus, uh, the closeout in fiscal twenty one, the write up here in fiscal twenty two and fiscal twenty three. Uh, federal legislation has dispersed four point seven trillion dollars so far. The Federal Reserve has purchased three and a half trillion dollars in treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. That serves to bolster the asset markets. It is clear that the stimulus has saved our country from a deep recession. It has stabilized our capital markets, and it is continuing to circulate throughout the economy. That money is circulating. There is money sitting out there that has still yet to circulate. So we have not seen uh, the full cycle of the federal stimulus yet. And that's not just because the federal government has not spent all of the money, but it is because American consumers have saved a large share of the money. It has gone into savings and checking accounts. It has gone into the asset markets to some degree. And we know that some level of that will come out over the next year or two as angst over COVID is relieved, as folks can get back to work, uh, and as spending opportunities become more normal. Uh, as we all know, we still can't go out and do all the same things uh, that we used to do or perhaps that we want to do. But one thing uh, seems clear at this point, and that is reflected in this forecast, the stimulus will likely permanently elevate the state's revenue base. I say likely because this is still the first year, and I never like to be absolute with something that is so new right at the very beginning. So that's why I cage that with the word likely, but I believe there's a very high likelihood that we have a permanent increase in our revenue base going forward because of the stimulus. This is a slide that I've shown over many of the prior BRE meetings just to illustrate the federal stimulus. This is not all of it. This is made up to show a uh, federal stimulus that went directly to uh, consumers effectively, mainly through the unemployment insurance program, uh, as well as the stimulus checks. Uh, these total $40 billion through July. It's equal to about 10% of the state's entire econo economic output pre-COVID. To put that into context, that is the size of our professional and business services industry. All of our lawyers, all of our engineers, accountants, the highest valued uh, industry in the state of Maryland, it's like we created one. That's to put the fiscal stimulus into perspective. Significant sum of money. We've seen it affect the entirety of the population. Uh, this slide is from the Federal Reserve. Uh, it's a new way that they are tracking uh, wealth uh, across the country. This is national. And it looks at the net worth of the top 1%, the next 9%, the next 40, and the bottom 50. That's how they uh, calibrate these. It indexes. So everybody starts out at the same level in 2019. You can see that everyone dips at the beginning of 2021. And then as the stimulus programs come in, there is an acceleration in asset wealth. Uh, you can see that the bottom 50% has the largest gains at over 30%. Now, of course, this is all relative. So if you had $1,000 in that bottom 50%, you now have 1,300. Whereas the top 1%, if you had a billion dollars and you go up 20%, it's a lot more money. But I think what this illustrates is that the stimulus was very successful in getting to folks all throughout the wealth spectrum. And that was its intention. It was perhaps a failure after the Great Recession and uh, I think this is a this is this is a very significant and important point. 
Um, now, much of it in the bottom 50% is in checking accounts. OK, for the other groups, it's going up in assets, especially real estate and stock market. Uh, but nonetheless, this is this is a victory here. Pivoting to close out because we need to discuss that to to really get into the future. And much of the close out was related to activity in 2020, tax year 2020. Um, we now have a very. Uh, confident estimate that tax year 20 actually grew 7.3%. That's a tax year where we lost 14.4% of our jobs within two months of COVID. And then 6.6% were still lost by year end. We still grew 7.3%. It still seems counterintuitive. Much of this is because we now know that the jobs lost were in the lower end of the wage spectrum. Um, and it's not to discount those jobs, but the state's revenue structure is set up to reduce the impact of those jobs. We have a progressive tax structure. We do our best uh, to tax lower wage jobs as little as possible. And we've seen that in our revenue structure. Uh, because those were the jobs that lost, we did not lose as much revenue. On top of that, asset gains and business income appear to have been very strong. The S&P 500 fell 35, 34% at the onset of the pandemic, then increased 11% by year end, and it's now 32% higher than it was pre-pandemic. Tremendous increase in asset prices, also offering the opportunity to make tremendous capital gains, and we believe that occurred in tax year 20. Business income, I mentioned, was strong. We know there are lots of businesses out there that are struggling, particularly the smaller businesses. But especially the large businesses that had the means uh, to go after the PPP loans uh, to sustain their business into the new economy, the post-COVID economy, were able to do so and likely increase their profitability. Um, we know this because we've seen a surge in payments for taxpayers uh, that traditionally have business income and capital gains income uh, through that extended due date on 715, the Comptroller's Office. Uh, in order to help folks extended that due date to July 15th. We saw a tremendous influx of payments. Um, so we are building off of a very positive tax year 2020, uh, and that's very important. I want to focus on employment because that does drive the bulk of our revenue. It doesn't drive a lot of the volatility, but it drives a bulk of our revenue. This indexes all of the prior uh, post-World War II recession. So you can see how deep the job losses were and how long the recovery was to take place. The green line there falling the deepest is the coronavirus pandemic. You see that immediate drop of more than 14%. A quick V-shaped recovery, which finds us at just under 4% uh, 4 of jobs still missing at this point in time. Uh, we do expect the recovery of the remainder of jobs to drag out a bit longer. It won't be as much of a V-shape, uh, but I think we'll know more about that in the, in the coming months. With school back in, uh, with the UI expiring, I think we're going to see some different movement uh, in, in the labor force. Now, all of this is, of course, very dependent on the virus. If we start to see a surge in cases in schools, uh, that could really change the trajectory of the employment scenario. To look very quickly at where this job picture is uh, through the end of August, we're still short a little bit more than 100,000 jobs. This means, you know, while we're talking about a aggregate revenue picture here that is very positive, there are still 100,000 Marylanders that are without jobs that had them before the pandemic. Uh, it's still tough out there. And as you can see, these jobs are in the lower paying industries. So these were likely households that were struggling to make ends meet uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, the bulk of the jobs lost naturally are still in accommodation and food services. Uh, but then we still see it in healthcare, uh, in retail, uh, and still to some degree in government. Government has jumped back. A lot of those lost government jobs were related to school support. And now with school back in, many of those jobs have been regained. Um, so all in all, the jobs picture has gotten quite a bit better, but it is still lacking relative to pre-COVID. All of that goes to look at our wage and salary forecast. This is the wage forecast that is being adopted by the Board of Revenue Estimates. You can see that compared to our March forecast. 
we see an improvement in 2021. We've seen some of that already in our withholding collections. We saw a tremendous uh, sum of bonuses paid out in the month of March. Uh, that tells us that companies also have begun to recognize they had a good 2020. They're rewarding their employees where they can. We see that. We believe on top of that, we're seeing ongoing wage gains. And we believe that to be broad based across industries. Let me show that on the next slide. This is a very busy slide uh, for a PowerPoint presentation, but I want this in as an artifact on the official record. Uh, the bottom line there, the x-axis are industry codes. Uh, these are NAICS codes. They're a little bit tweaked by us because we use some specific numbers uh, to get more detail ourselves. But what we have here is January to August cash withholding by industry. The gray line is 2021. I'll draw your eye to 54, that's professional and business services. Again, these are our, our, uh, our lawyers, our scientists, our accountants. It is the highest paying industry in the aggregate in the state of Maryland. And you can see a surge there in 2021. You also see it in 52, that's finance and insurance. We know the finance industry has done quite well. Uh, the federal government has started to regain employment that was lost during the prior administration and is also paying wages. I draw your eye to those three industries, but it's hard also to find a industry grouping here that is not growing. Other than the ones that are struggling employment wise, such as uh, the restaurant industry, you see them staggering. But the rest of the industries in large that have been able to adapt and operate through COVID uh, are prospering from a wage-based perspective. And that's huge for the state's revenue structure. Capital owners, another huge component of our income tax, also in, uh, affecting the wealth, which affects spending. You see the huge dip over there in 2020 and then the quick resurgence in capital markets and then continued growth through 2021. We are very confident that 2021 capital gains growth will be significant. I think it's very important to note, as I move to the next slide to illustrate capital gains dollars, uh, the capital gains in our forecast are now more than a billion dollars of state revenue, a tremendous share uh, of the income tax, a tremendous share of the overall funding stream. That green bar there shows our forecast. Uh, this is inflation adjusted, so we can compare to prior periods, and you can see that we do have capital gains breaching the level that was hit during the dot-com bubble. We're still below the Great Recession peaks, uh, but we are going higher. We should be higher. With the influx of Federal Reserve dollars into capital markets and the ability of corporations to sustain profits, we should see higher capital gains going forward. But that is not to take away from the volatility of capital gains. Typically, if we hit a snag on wage growth, it occurs over a long period of time. Capital gains can evaporate very rapidly. Uh, it is important to note that we have a muted revenue volatility cap that was put in place by the legislature with work from DBM as well as my office. Um, and I would encourage the legislature and the governor's office to take that up. This is exactly the right time to be considering bolstering that revenue volatility cap so that it can help the state should we see uh, a turn down in capital gains. Bringing it all together to look at taxable income, this is baseline. We've had a considerable number of legislative changes. Baseline means that I try to take out the, uh, the legislative changes so we can really see underlying income growth. The orange line there is our September forecast compared to March. And you can see in 20, uh, for 2020, back in March, we thought we were going to get 3.4%, which seemed very high at the time. I think baseline growth was about 6.6%. We expect that to accelerate to 79 in tax year 21. Uh, this is driven by those wage gains I mentioned, as well as continued improvement in capital gains and business income. So we do see a continued recovery in business in, in taxable income uh, into 21 before it starts to stabilize and come down to more normal growth rates in the out years of the forecast. I mentioned that not all of the federal stimulus has likely circulated throughout the economy more broadly at this point. 
This chart shows several things. First, the blue line is disposable personal income. This is national data. Um, this is all post uh, 2007, so you can see some history. And one thing you see is as we get into 2020 with COVID, we see an increase in personal income. That's the federal stimulus. Not only do we see an increase, we perhaps see an acceleration of personal income. So we did not see a reduction in income from this recession. We saw an acceleration. The orange bars are the savings rate. So of disposable income, what percentage of that gets saved? Uh, post Great Recession, where we saw folks come back to more reasonable rates of savings, that average Um, of, of federal money uh, as an inability from taxpayers to spend that money. Those combined to go to $2.4 trillion in excess savings over that period of time. $2.4 trillion. Some of that is surely coming out. Some of it will likely stay saved, but some of it is absolutely going to enter the consumer market. Uh, and that is a a positive risk in our forecast. We don't know when and we don't know how, uh, but we do expect a large share of that to come out. That is visible in our sales tax forecast. Uh, this shows what I call here the traditional sales tax, as well as what I call the blueprint sales tax. So the legislature uh, has acted to make sure that we are taxing remote sell, remote sellers, marketplace facilitators, and now some digital goods. This has helped bring the sales tax base uh, more in line with the 21st century economy. Um, and we are seeing those revenues. Uh, this is not all of the money that goes to the blueprint fund, but this is the money that's really derived from those sources. Uh, and you can see we saw that pick up in fiscal 20 naturally as more, more, more goods were purchased online. Uh, we also saw that throughout fiscal 21. We expect to continue to see that accelerate into fiscal 22 and fiscal 23. Uh, to be sure, the sales tax would have missed out and perhaps have been down significantly in the absence of that base expansion during COVID. So getting into the risks, obviously we're not out of the woods with the virus. The virus is constantly evolving. Delta is everywhere. We don't know where we're going to go next there. As I mentioned earlier, school has only just restarted with in-person uh, uh, schooling. That has been very beneficial to the labor market. We expect that to continue to be beneficial for the labor, mar labor market, but any large outbreaks could prove quite detrimental uh, uh, to the market and therefore our forecast. Uh, it's worth noting that improvements in vaccination rates will improve economic outcomes and revenues. So if we can build upon that high base that Maryland has, uh, we will see an improvement in economic activity. Inflation, the big boogeyman that sits out there uh, that is constantly talked about, we agree that is mostly transient, which means that it will be temporary in nature in large. There are supply, supply chain issues that are boosting uh, CPI inflation. Um, since April, we've seen infl inflation grow above 4% uh, in every month. It's been above 5% since June on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, part of that is explained because we're going against periods where we were in the depths of COVID and much of the economy was shut down. And, uh, inflation was approaching zero during those time periods. So we're we are comparing against very weak periods, but absolutely we are seeing the impacts of supply constraints uh, and, and it's shifting from one industry to the next. We're all aware of the lumber shortages at this point in time. We're all aware of used vehicles, uh, prices soaring above 30, 40%. Uh, this is really happening in durables. I do expect to see this to continue for the next year as it crosses certain industries and out of others. Most of it will subside when those supply chain issues uh, are removed and we should see prices of those durable goods come back down. But as I mentioned, we are seeing wage growth. Wage growth will put upwards pressure on inflation. It absolutely will. It's important to note that the Federal Reserve has tools to reduce inflation should it come to that. They can use them. They will tamp down on the economic expansion 
that is not built into this forecast. This forecast assumes that the Federal Reserve's policy responses will proceed as they have them planned. Uh, and we agree with that at this point in time, but it is absolutely something to monitor and to keep on the list of risks. Long-term growth prospects. Economists say that you, there is no such thing as a free lunch. All of this uh, federal stimulus, much of it is deficit financed, which is why it is accruing to our bottom line. It is why the revenues are going up. When the government borrows more and borrows heavily like this, it will tend to put pressure on forward growth prospects. We do expect once we're recovered from the COVID recession that we will see slow economic growth rates uh, uh, post recovery. And we do have that built into our long-term forecast. Some of this can be overcome if we make improved investments in, in infrastructure, meaningful infrastructure, as well as investments in the underemployed working age population. Those are opportunities that are sitting out there in the existing workforce where investments could be substantial and could lead to long-term economic growth. Uh, so we can overcome the uh, expectation of lower future growth rates, but I do believe it will take investments in our underserved working age population. And I do want to close with optimism. I mentioned those risks, but again, we are seeing broad-based wage growth. We haven't seen broad-based wage growth. Uh, we were starting to see it right before the pandemic. Um, we were starting to see inkling of it. Uh, but we never really saw it coming in full force. We are seeing it now. The labor market is shifting. Uh, there has been a significant increase in the number of employees shifting jobs. Shifting jobs is a very good thing for the economy. Folks start to know where they want to be. And when you get into a job that is more uh, relatable to your actual interests, you will excel. It's good for the economy. The professional, professional maturation of the millennial generation. This is not a dig on the millennial generation. This happens with every generation. When you start to hit those uh, mid 30s, late 30s, early 40s, that's when you start to excel in your income earning uh, uh, professions. Uh, that relates to the reordering of the labor market. That's a very good thing for the economy and productivity. Uh, I think we'll continue to see strong non-wage income growth. Business income is gonna be robust. Uh, things that have been learned during the COVID, uh, COVID recession will carry forward and make all of us more productive going forward. This is a very good thing for future economic growth. Uh, pent up demand is substantial and able as we, as we mentioned, and then again, continued improvements in efficiency and productivity. So I think there is a lot of reason to be bullish about the near term. I think there's a lot of reason to be bullish about the long term. It's not to say that it's all going to go as smoothly as we predict in this forecast. There will be some bumps along the way, I'm sure, in the next five to six to seven years. I feel very confident in this year and the next year, um, and I am very confident about the future. So with that, I'll conclude my remarks and turn it back to uh, the comptroller. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Andy, and uh, thank you for ending with a little bit of optimism because there's always a large amount of uncertainty and anxiety with these, but you, as usual, produced outstanding work, and this is an exceptional report, and I think I speak for the Treasurer and the Budget Secretary, and I also want to thank the entire BRE staff, uh, along with the Revenue Monitoring Committee, for the, <clears throat> the thoroughness and the long work hours that everybody put in to draw up these estimates. It's never easy. Uh, your professionalism and expertise of your team working collaboratively, which is what I, I underline is important here in Maryland. We all work, all the stakeholders are at the table as far as these revenue estimates. It allows us to make responsible, tough decisions that strengthen our economy, ensure our long-term growth, and actually safeguards the economy for the people of the great state of Maryland. I appreciate the challenges that you noted in preparing these reports, especially when incorporating unforeseen factors such as the influx of federal stimulus money, much as it's welcome, but it's just a, like a fire hydrant of cash that has come in and that's somewhat unexpected. But the continued effects of the pandemic are also uncertain and uh, you have indicated, I think, that you've covered most of the 
issues. As you noted in the report, this board is being asked to approve recommendations that would increase our March 2021 revenue projections for fiscal year 2022 to $21.1 billion, an increase of $995 million, just under, under a billion dollars. Additionally, we'll be voting on the first official estimates for fiscal year 2023, which is projected to be $22.2 billion. That also is $1.37 billion more than, Andy, you and your team had previously forecast. <clears throat> These estimates factor in the broad expansion of income and spending that is attributable to the federal stimulus money. These stimulus payments, both at the state and federal level, I want to emphasize, did exactly what they were supposed to do. They stimulated spending, increased consumerism, which in turn led to strong sales tax numbers. But we also saw better than expected numbers in wage gains. Corporate sales tax numbers are also much higher than projected and serve as a positive sign that bigger businesses were able to sustain or expand even in the face of the pandemic. The influx of federal pandemic relief funding provided much needed help across our state. It allowed Maryland to survive a major economic downturn from the pandemic. And we still, as you note, have yet to see the full impact of the stimulus in our state's economy. Reasonable estimates put excess COVID era saving levels, as you said, at a historic high of $2.4 trillion nationwide. This means that there still is a large amount of consumer spending uh, in checking accounts of people around the country waiting to be spent. And that has not impacted the bottom line around the country or even here in Maryland quite yet. The leaders of the state of Maryland are now presented with a unique and rare historic opportunity to show our citizens what our financial priorities are. But first, I hope that we would learn lessons from what we've gone through and put in place the delivery methods that ensure these funds are going to Marylanders who need the help the most and are not handy, landing in the hands, for example, of fraudsters, something the state has not done well during the pandemic. The numbers in today's forecast report and yesterday's news of a massive $2.5 billion fund balance, that $2.5 billion is completely separate, partly from this, uh, this is a, it actually presents the state with a unique once in a generation opportunity. All told, it means state budget writers and policymakers have nearly $5 billion in unanticipated revenue as they begin constructing the fiscal year 2023 budget. We now have a level of financial flexibility we have never, or frankly, never experienced, in my opinion, historically, but definitely for decades. The fund balance and projected revenues give us an opportunity to invest in our state's most valuable resources, its residents. As this budget surplus proves, their strength is Maryland's strength. Move stable, the move stabilizes their, the more stable that their wages are, the more robust that people's savings are, the greater their ability to spend as consumers, and then the greater our tax revenues are year after year. The bottom third of wage earners deserve the freedom from want and insecurity that the top two thirds of the wage earners have demonstrated. And by achieving that they too can fuel the financial strength of our state, just as the top two thirds of our wage earners have. Let's get this right and fix broken systems that have delayed unemployment benefits, rental assistance, child care provider payments, and more. Let's prevent in my humble opinion, the economic freefall many still fear today. If tens of thousands of Maryland families fearing uh, the economic freefall, and let's create a foundation for the economic stability we can foster tomorrow and in the years ahead. It's not enough to say that we put money into these programs. We must be able to say we put money actually in the hands of those who truly needed it. And we need to give them a ladder to the prosperity they're capable of obtaining with a truly level playing field. We also must fortify, I believe, at the same time, Maryland's rainy day fund, which currently sits at $631 million. The fiscal year 22 budget already plans to bring this up to $1.4 billion, but I recommend we divert even more to bolster the fund now that our projected revenues are much higher. 
there's a potential for us to do a lot of good for a lot of people, but we must get it right. While there are many positive takeaways from this report, it would be foolhardy to assume Maryland's economy is even close to fully recovered. As Mr. Schaffel noted in his report, today's numbers have been adjusted to include several factors that have occurred over the past several months, and there's still much that we cannot accurately predict. Having a $2.5 billion balance in the state's general fund does not mean that all Marylanders are doing fine right now. Actually, it's, it only serves as a reminder of how there are in fact two Marylands right now. There's a part of Maryland, which is about two thirds of our population where employees can work remotely, invest their wealth in the markets and run businesses successfully. But there's another third, tens of thousands of Maryland families who continue to suffer financial hardship through no fault of their own. Unemployment benefits are expiring for those who lost their jobs and have been unable to find new positions. With the moratorium on evictions lifted, tens of thousands of Marylanders are facing eviction from their homes. Yes, the states reduced unemployment from the catastrophic 14%, down to 6%, but that's still far too many of our fellow Marylanders without jobs. The backbone of our economy is our family owned mom and pop businesses located in the hearts of our communities. Many of these businesses were unable, unable, I emphasize that, to access federal relief funds, and they're still struggling, or tragically, tens of thousands of them are gone forever. If we can invest some of these funds, the $5 billion total amount, if we can invest some of that in stabilizing these businesses, our state's financial economic footing will strengthen alongside these hardworking small business owners. Today's report may allow us to be confident about Maryland's overall fiscal picture for the next two years, but we have these big uncertainties built into our future. The forecast assumes, as Andy said, the federal government will pass a budget today, tonight, and that they're gonna pass a debt ceiling increase this fall in Washington. The biggest lesson this pandemic has taught us is months and even years of careful analysis and planning on behalf of the state of Maryland for something like this, it can change in an instant. Although this report gives us a level of security we're not felt in more than a year, it would remain wise, I believe, to not assume we have a clear path back to prosperity. No one can predict the next recession. No one knows the long-term effect of the heightened levels of federal debt or how inflation will factor into our economic projections. We must also remind ourselves that we're still dealing with an unpredictable pandemic. We must continue to be smart with our money because this sugar high from federal dollars will eventually wear off. And, and if we don't prepare for long-term success, we will fail the state of Maryland and its taxpayers. With that said, I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, Treasurer Kopp, if you have a statement you'd like to make, uh, please go ahead and excuse the length of mine. Maybe uh, yours can be brief and we can combine the two. Mine will be very brief and we can combine, combine um, I, I heartily endorse uh, uh, what the comptroller has said. Um, Andy, you guys have done an excellent job. And I just want to reiterate what both the comptroller and you have said. We always thank all the staff who work on this. But I think it's important not just to thank them, but to point out to everyone who is going to be reading about this news, the Maryland process before this, these numbers come to the Board of uh, Revenue Estimates and then to the Board of Public Works, these numbers have been examined by the top economists and financial uh, gurus in the Comptroller's Office, the Treasurer's Office, the Legislature, and the Department of Budget and Management. This is a joint and well-vetted, um, if very unusual, uh, um, the report that, that you're bringing to us in which we will, I'm quite sure, endorse. 
Um, yes, the stimulus worked. It did exactly what it was supposed to do, which was to keep the economy running and people uh, employed in very, very dark times. Um, I would point out, as you mentioned, uh, Andy, um, when you look at these job categories, it's quite clear that those who are in the most vulnerable jobs, particularly in, in hospitality and retail, are the ones who have the lowest salaries to start with, and the ones who uh, on your chart, in fact, have quite low growth. Everyone grew, but it, again, as we, or at least I've said often, rich get richer. Uh, the middle class is staving off problems, and the poor, we hope, are keeping their heads above water. If we could follow your advice and improve our infrastructure and make substantial investments in the un underemployed working age population and those parts of our, um, our economic engine that truly is the economic engine. People, we said last year were essential, but now sometimes we forget how essential they are. Put the money into the training system, our education system, which the blueprint uh, attempts to do. If we are smart about using the resources we have, we have a very strong and bright future. But I think that in our celebration of good numbers, we tend to sometimes sort of smooth over things, which really we should acknowledge, pick up, and make our cause the, the enhanced uh, equity and the enhanced economic vigor of the entire state. And with that, Mr. Comptroll, I certainly do agree uh, that this is a report we ought to endorse. We are delighted to have Mr. Secretary Brinkley, the Secretary of DBM, and uh, David, thank you, because your staff has been fabulous in collaboration, I guess I would describe it. Right. Well, thank you, uh, um, Mr. Comptroller and Madam Treasurer. Uh, I, I do appreciate those comments and those accolades uh, to, to all of our staffs. And I certainly want to thank Andy and the entire Revenue Estimate team, but I, I think what a lot of the viewers maybe don't appreciate is that they had the workload to try to deal with the closeout, which was announced yesterday too, to try to integrate all this and and get caught up on all that. The, the, the workload that had to take place for the combination of the closeout and then also these revised estimates, not just with what the data said, but then the confirmation of some of this so that they could report this out so that we try to, to work with the best data possible. And this is indeed good news following on the heels of yesterday's closeout news, but it also uh, provides a cushion as we continue to grapple with the, the personal, the professional, certainly the economic, the social, and our community's impacts to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Both of you referenced that in, in your comments. I'll point out that caution is still the operative word, especially when you look back over where we have been over just the past 18 months. 18 months ago, the pandemic started having its massive impact on Marylanders. Last year at this time, we were still grappling with unexpected revenue news, massive expenditures to deal with the virus's impact, including, remember, ramping up for vaccination clinics of which we had no vaccination at that point in time, but we knew they were forthcoming and we knew that we had to be prepared uh, to get those vaccines in people's arms. And we were also trying to prepare for any eventuality uh, that might come in front of us. Many Marylanders a year ago, uh, well, they were hammered with an economic shockwave uh, that no one could have foreseen. Students were still not in our classrooms, and the winter wave of infection was still unknown to us. Were it not for the quick and decisive actions of Governor Hogan, problems would have been even more widespread and much, much deeper. The governor's action also, as chairman of the National Governors Association when the pandemic began, certainly jump-started the federal response to assist all of our states deal with this pandemic's impact. And I point this out so that we can look back at where we were, acknowledge our progress, but also recognize that we today 
certainly are not out of the woods. If anything, the operative word going forward is volatility. Just as we rewrite these numbers upward, something as yet not determined or identified can force us to rewrite them again. We will therefore ensure that the state can be adaptable to whatever arises in our futures, both positive and negative. I also point out that none of this just happened. There are many, many dedicated team members of the state. You've heard us reference those of our staffs here, the comptrollers, the treasurers, and certainly DBM. But let's point out, let's point out that the healthcare systems, our emergency service providers, the private sector, you name it, all of those had to come together to make things happen. However, we do have the resources now to deal with some of these impacts. I applaud the governor and the legislature for striking a very important budget agreement in which the state's priorities were delineated in how we allocate the federal and state resources. We maintain our lines of communication with the legislature and the constituencies to ensure that we spend these resources from the federal government in full compliance with the federal government's continually changing guidelines. In fact, yesterday, DBM presented to certain county leaders where we are, and DBM is providing, if desired, support to the state's municipalities to implement and properly report on their share of federal assistance. And with this increase in revenues, we can look at opportunities to maintain Maryland on a steady yet reliable trajectory in our recovery from the impact of this virus. As the governor said in yesterday's statement on the very positive closeout news, quote, Maryland is experiencing one of the strongest health and economic recoveries in the nation. But he went on to add that Maryland will continue to practice fiscal discipline while prioritizing relief that advances our recovery. Uh, on that, again, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, our team members that certainly contributed to a lot of this product. Uh, I look forward to continuing our work and our dialogue, not only with your teams, but also with the legislature as we move forward. So uh, in the past, traditionally, I've, I've made a, uh, a motion to, to accept this, but Madam Treasurer, I, th I think maybe sometimes I've stepped out of line in doing that. So maybe that's <laughs> you to make that motion. Yeah, very good thing to do. Um, I, I would be happy to, to, uh, to make a motion. Let me just note that the United States Senate just uh, uh, legislation to extend the budget for two months until the 3rd of December, which is the first step they have to take and a very good thing. And with that in mind, I would move uh, adoption of uh, the report before us on the revenue estimates. And, I think uh, the specific language is adopt the September general fund estimates of 21.0 no 096 billion for fiscal year 2022 and 22.246 billion for fiscal year 2023. Madam Treasurer, that's what I, I said. That's what you said. <laughs> uh, Mr. I'll, I'll second that motion and I'll point out that uh, one of the caveats that Andy said that there was a foundation of this whole report, as the Treasurer just reported, at least that's been deferred until December. So we know we're on firm footing at least until that point in time. <laughs> Maybe we should send Andy Schaffel down the road to Washington. <laughs> uh, only if he okay. comes back again. Okay. Uh, so the motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, none in dissent. Mr. Schaffel, thank you very much. Brilliant effort. And, thank you uh, all, members of the board. Much appreciated. Thank appreciate everyone who is on the uh, call. Uh, obviously, we're available uh for individual uh, conversations if, if anybody so desires. But thank you, uh, uh, Madam Treasurer, for your support. And uh, Mr. Secretary, it's just invaluable to have a collegial, adult, mature relationship between the different branches of government and being able to produce something that uh, is, is accurate, uh, but obviously uh, positioned and to be nimble if uh, conditions change. What a contrast to Washington. So. <laughs> Thank you for your leadership and chairmanship, Mr. Comptroller. Thank you very much. And Andy will uh, pass. Uh, go, go and go and take your team out for a celebratory drink, please. On me, because you <laughs> guys did great. Okay, all the best. Take care. Thanks all. Bye bye. Bye bye.